Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. And um, I'm going to talk about astronomy. Now, astronomy is something we assume is something you indulge in as a matter of pleasure when you have spare time or nothing else to do. And the point that I want to make is that astronomy, in fact, is significantly um, important for our life and our activity, and it has changed our, the way humans are organized in many, many ways. So that's the point I want to make. I want to show you how fundamental it has been to everything that we are and everything that we do. Uh, it has helped us organize our life. It has created technologies. It has um, changed the way our life's um, approach looks and everything. And it has played a crucial role in um, our life and the time uh, since time immemorial. And that's the point I want to make. Ever since we realized that the sun rises in the east only in the general sense of the world and sets in the west only in the general sense of the world and not really exactly in the east and exactly in the west, everything changed for us. We realized that if the sun rises to the south of east, it, um, um, it is essentially winter and the sun will not, uh, it'll be cold. And if it rises north of east, then it becomes so much warmer and therefore the day becomes brighter. So we began associating the exact location of sunrise point and um, uh, the seasons, and that changed everything about the way we looked at the universe. And this is the story of that change and how it continues to change our life today. The night sky has fascinated us for a long time. So from a long time, we have been looking at the night sky, various aspects of the night sky, and we have been st staring at it, thinking about it, creating new ideas, creating new uh, purposes for it, and we have looked at the sky in a variety of ways. Uh, astronomy is both surprisingly utilitarian and surprisingly fascinating as a matter of philosophy. Artists have used it, used its images to create images on the ground. These are two rock, this is a rock art from Humpy, which shows about imaginations of life and afterlife and the sun and the phases of moon and so on. Farmers have used it for a long time because it tells you what season to expect, depending on where exactly the sun rises in the night sky. Travelers have used it to find directions in night, to know where to go, how to go. Even today, if you tell a fisherman to take you to Dubai or something, he will tell you that you travel along this constellation for so many days, and then you travel to another constellation for so many days, and you would reach wherever you want to reach. Calendar makers have, of course, used it. The 29-day um, uh, lunar month is what defines our, um, our month, and then 12 full moons make one year. So the one year division into 12 months also comes from astronomy and not from other considerations. Priests have used it to worship the great heavens because it is the great heavens who fertilize the Mother Earth, and that is how we get life on Earth. So priests have worshipped Earth for a long, long time. And last but not the least, scientists have used it to try and understand how the universe works. The simplest way of understanding astronomy actually is to put a stick on the ground. Essentially, that's all you need to do, because if you put a stick on the ground, you get all kinds of imagine. Uh, imagine there is a st uh, um, st stick in the ground coming out from the center of this image. And like a sundial, as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, the shadow will move in the curvature direction over one day. So over one day, the sun shadow goes from left to right. And as the sun's direction of um, sunrise changes, the vertical shadow changes over the period of one year. So just a stick in the ground gives you enough information to tell you not only of the day of the at the hour of the day, but the day of the month, and the upcoming seasons and outgoing seasons. And so, for example, at some winter solstice, the sun is over here, the shadow goes on the top line, and so on. A simple shadow like this will tell you all that you need to know about astronomy, but it took us enormously long time to figure this out. Before that, people have made all kinds of elaborate structures. Stonehenge is an obvious example of keeping track of the movement of the sun and the moon in the night sky. Sun also gives us a variety of clocks. It gives us hours, days, weeks, fortnight, month, year. And over hundreds of years, you have been able to track because of various astronomical changes that happen in the night sky. They give you all these measures. In fact, the obvious question to ask is, why do we have a circle which is 360 degrees and not, say, 400 degrees or something? It is precisely because of astronomy. 360 is close to 365 days for a year. And for a long time, we thought 360 days made the year. And that is why this angular size of 360 also comes from astronomy. Humans have visualized various objects in the night sky. If you think about it, we think of gods, rishis, humans, animals, myths, all kinds of things happen in the sky. And we look at all these things in the night sky. The images like these 
from very early, people would realize that, look, if you have Earth, the Earth is parched, and only if the rains come from the heavens, then you get greenery on Earth. The life is rejuvenated because of rains from the skies. So Mother Earth and Father Sky is one of the oldest images that humans have created. And in fact, even Neanderthals are believed to have had some kind of an idea about um, Mother Earth being fertilized by Father Sky. And so these kind of images in rock art are seen at a variety of places. This is from Kashmir, where you can see this human being, a, a superhuman in the top, who controls the movement of the sun and the moon. And these kind of images go back to several thousands of years, to several tens of thousands of years. So right from the beginning, humans have had this idea of Mother Earth and Father Sky. Then there are events like this, which we believe is one of the earliest records of something strange that happened in the sky. There was a star, when typically a star explodes, and if it is sufficiently close to you, it actually becomes brighter than even the sun or the moon in the night sky, especially the moon. It's not very difficult to outshine the moon if there's a good spectacular explosion of star. And we believe that in 3000 BC, there was an explosion of a star sufficiently close to us. And it has been recorded in a rock art from Kashmir, which is probably our earliest records of noting down something strange that happened in the sky. Other interesting myths, people have not only looked at the sky in the same manner. Everybody looks at the sky in a different manner. All of us have a different visual images. And communities and cultures have their own images. So I want to take one example from a community called Gonds. Gonds are um, tribals who live in central Maharashtra today. And they have an interesting myth. Uh, this is a very, very well-known constellation of Saptarshi. We see it in the night sky very nicely. This points to the pole stars and so on. And this is supposed to be the seven great rishis um, of Indian mythology. But to Gons, this is in fact a merger of two different situations where there is an old lady caught over here in these four stars. And there are these three thieves who are trying to steal the cot. And the story goes that if, these three, uh, if the lady goes to sleep, then the thieves will manage to steal the cot. And therefore, all hell will break loose. And therefore, this lady is not allowed to sleep, or essentially, this constellation is not allowed to set. In 1000 B until 1000 BC, in central India, this constellation never set. In modern times, it sets because of the way the Earth moves and so on. But until about 1000 BC, this constellation never set in the night sky. And therefore, Gons have their beliefs, which goes back to 1000 BC, which is good 3000 years. The other evidence is to suggest that the Gons were settled from that time and so on. But you actually have memory of ancient events still situated in the night sky memory. Another interesting feature is that these are the seven sisters, or Pleiades as it is called. These are the seven wives of the seven rishis who were not paying enough attention, so they all left them. And this is a very well-known constellation of Pleiades, which is called um, Seven Sisters in India. But the same constellation, depending on who you are, will look very different to you. So if you are a Banjara, this looks like a piece of jewelry to you. If you are a Kolam or a Pardi, who are essentially scavengers of um, farming land, to them, it looks like a pack of birds. If you are a Korku who depend on meat and meat products for their lives, this looks like minced meat to them being prepared for the gods to eat. If you are a Gond, then this appears like the stick that you use to clear the husk from farming, because Gonds are essentially farmers. If you are a Varli, who is essentially an art devoted, quiet set of people, to them, the same constellation looks like a candle, uh, a dia. To the people of Nicobar, who live by the sea and live by the islands, um, there's one group that would believe that it's a great king and his entourage which is traveling. There's another group that thinks that there's a group of elders who are looking at you from the heavens to make sure that everything goes fine. And in classical Indian mythology, of course, these are the seven wives of the seven priests of Saptarshi. Essentially, how you look at sky depends on who you are. If you are a farmer, you will think it's something to help you with farming. If you are a businessman, it is something that's a piece of jewelry. And everything in between is what you can see in the sky. Humans have imagined all kinds of things. Then there are some strange structures that come up. There's a place called Bison near Udupi in India, which is a completely random collection of stones. And you would think that they are completely useless random pieces of rock until you go back and simulate to see what it is. It is one of the finest astronomical observatories that have been made in such a way that the shadow of one stone will go and touch another stone twice a year. 
at winter solstice and summer solstice. The stones are so precisely done in terms of height and the distance between the stones in, is that you would see the shadow of one stone on the other stone only twice a year. So all that you had to do was to go and stand in that field and depending on how far the shadow was from the stone which it was supposed to meet, you would be able to tell a calendar or you would be able to tell the time of the year. Then one of the finest temples, uh, finest Hindu temples is in Cambodia. It's called uh, Angkor Wat and it's, it's a magnificent piece of work and I'll show you how magnificent it is. It has these three great uh, towers at the entrance and the three great towers correspond actually to the sunrise at equinoxes and at the solstices. But the magnificent part comes in when you go inside the temple. It is a one kilometer by 800 meter size temple. And because Indians believe that the world of humans is covered by water, this entire area is covered by a lake, which is essentially a perpetual lake, and the temple sets inside. And it's a non-trivial technology because water levels can change and water percolates into the ground. So if you're not very careful, this kind of structures can be very unstable. So the entire engineering has been done to make sure that irrespective of how the water level changes, your temple is stable. And as you walk into the temple, you have to walk these 1,030, 1032 steps to make sure that you reach the great abode of the heavens, which is the central square there. And then there are seven levels of walking up because of the seven levels of heaven. And at the top, when you reach, you see Buddha or you see Shiva originally. Now you see Buddha at the top of this temple, giving you the Mount Meru on which the great heavens reside. So huge, magnificent architectures, the constructions have been done based on astronomical ideas and astronomical beliefs. Astronomy today, of course, looks very different. It is a path that astronomy, we understand today, has varied because we have invented telescopes. We have been able to look at the heavens in far greater detail. We have realized that you can see light not just in optical light. You can see it in X-rays. You can see it in gamma rays. You can see it in a whole bunch of wavelengths. And each of these gives you a completely different view of the universe. It's like looking at the elephant, four blind men looking at an elephant, depending on which wavelength you look at you get a different slice of information about the universe. And now we are in a position where you can put all that together and you get some spectacular uh, insights. Then you can use your physics and you can use your chemistry to try and figure out what is happening in the universe. And last, of course, sat satellites have allowed us to do things which were unimaginable a generation ago. Together, they've produced a far more comprehensive picture of the universe and before I go to the universe, I want to show you something else. So this, for example, is a dish antenna. If you travel from Pune to Nashik, uh, near Narayangam, you see this kind of dishes. These are 40-meter um, dishes. A typical dish antenna for a television, for example, is a couple of uh, meter in size. These are 40-meter dishes. Essentially, 20 people can sit head to head across the diameter of this dish. It is the world's largest radio telescope. There are 40, 32 such dishes that cover a 1,000 square kilometer area between Nashik and Pune. And it is the world's largest meter wave radio telescope that we have in India. So technologies of immense uh, capabilities are built because of astronomy's demand. So modern astronomy is built essentially on highly sensitive instruments, high precision instrument because astronomy is limited high reliability instruments because once you send a satellite into space, you can never repair it. So it must work for tens of years without any fault. And this revolutioner has produced revolutionary equipment in a whole bunch of other fields, especially in fields like medicine. You have a whole bunch of medical tools um, which, are you, which are created originally for astronomy and which are now used in other subjects. Uh, it has given us a variety of medical tools. It has given us a variety of communication tools. GPS systems, etc. I hardly need to emphasize in a time when we all use Google Maps to go to strange places. On the other hand, it has also told us things about the heavens which we never imagined uh, sitting on the ground. So we know, for example, that the Earth has its own magnetic field which protects it from having uh, from intense radiation from the sun. If you didn't have that, essentially the life on Earth would be completely sterilized and no life on Earth would have been possible. But thanks to this great magnetic shield that we have, it protects us from the worst that the sun can throw, to us, throw on us. 
studies, uh, satellites like um, Chandrayaan have also shown us that there is water on moon. So at some stage, if you want to colonize moon, you know where to look for water on moon. And these kind of detailed maps are available. Now, hopefully, in another couple of months, we Indians should also have a car of our own to drive around on the moon. But six cars have gone so far. India should be adding a seventh car on the moon sometime very soon. On plan planets like Mars, we have seen evidence of water movement. We have seen landscape that looks not very different from what you would see in Deccan Plateau, because essentially it is iron oxide rocks. And you have actually seen, in the picture on the left you can see, where water must have one flowed and the water has evaporated, but the salt left behind by water that you typically see in any river in, on Earth is what you also see on Mars. So we have seen landscapes which are very similar to Earth in other places. On places like Jupiter and Saturn, we now know of gigantic cyclones that run into tens of thousands of kilometers, and that must have been devastating on the, on the planet's and atmosphere itself. We have seen stars being born. We have seen stars dying. We know in places like Orion Nebula, new stars are being born all the time. So we know that universe is not stationary. Things are happening. New things are being born. Old things are dying, and so on. The time scales may be absurd. The time scale may run into millions of years. But we can actually see stars being born and stars dying. And we have some, seen some strange stars. So there's a star called Antares, for example, that is so huge that the 700 suns would fit into its diameter. And how much is 700 suns? The entire Earth-Moon system would fit into the distance of that black little line. So all the entire solar system onto Jupiter would fit inside this star. And just to compare, compared to that star, the sun looks as small as that little dot at the bottom of the picture. But we have seen stars that are so huge, stars that are clearly not going to live very long. And when you say they're not going to live very long, we expect them to die in another 25,000 years or so, they would be dead. But by astronomical standard, that's an event that is about to happen. We have seen stars die. We know what happens. Stars die when they run out of their nuclear fuels. They explode and they die. And we have learned how the stars are born and how the stars die. We have seen the entire expanse of the universe and shown that it goes probably for 13.7 um, billion light years. It is a huge web-like structure. It is a filamentary structure. It is not smooth. We are not so sure what it is, but we suspect that it is a froth from the birth of the universe. The bubbling can still be seen today. And we know that the universe was born at a single point in a big bang. The entire space and time of the universe that you see today came from a single point at a single space 13.7 billion years ago. Before that, there was neither space nor time. The future lies, of course, in the fact that we can expand our observations from just radio electromagnetic radiation. We can now see gravity waves and such strange objects. We can explore the universe and our Earth through satellites for remote sensing and for communication. We can travel to the moon and beyond. And this at the bottom is a picture of India's planned first manned mission. We hope to send three people into space in Gaganyan sometime in 2022. And it will allow us to see the universe with far better accuracy and far better precision than we have managed so far. So lots of exciting challenges await us as astronomy progresses into future. Thank you very much.